Hi, I'm Vanessa from speakenglishwithvanessa.com. Let's have a real English conversation. Let's go. Today I have something super special to share with you. I'm going to share a real English conversation. A little over two years ago, my husband Dan and I bought our first house. And today you are going to meet our realtor, Brandy. A realtor, or sometimes we call them a real estate agent, is a professional who helps you to find and buy a house. In the US, if you want to buy a house, you need to hire a realtor. If this job isn't common in your country, don't worry, you'll learn a lot about it today. Brandy is really passionate about her job and how her job has completely changed her family's life. I'm sure that you also have things that you're passionate about, so it's a good experience to listen carefully and imitate the way that we speak. During our conversation, you will see some subtitles down here for some important vocabulary, phrasal verbs, and pronunciation. After you watch the conversation, there will be a vocabulary lesson where my husband Dan and I explain in detail some of the most important phrases so that you don't waste your time studying unimportant words. Ingrain these in your memory. It's great to hear them in the conversation, but when you also hear us explaining them in the vocabulary lesson, it will be even easier to remember them and use them yourself. After the vocabulary lesson, you will have a phrasal verb lesson where you will learn some of the most important phrasal verbs from the conversation with Brandy so that you can use them in your daily conversation. And finally, after the phrasal verb lesson, you will have a pronunciation lesson so that you can speak more like an American and speak clearly and understandably. You can always click CC on this lesson to view the full subtitles so that you don't miss any words. And of course, to help you remember everything from today's long lesson, I have created a free PDF worksheet where you will remember all of the vocabulary, phrasal verbs, pronunciation, sample sentences, and you'll be able to answer Vanessa's challenge question at the bottom of the free PDF worksheet. You can click on the link in the description to download that free worksheet today. And if you enjoyed this lesson, I invite you to join me in the Fearless Fluency Club where you can finally learn real American English and speak confidently. Our course member Ildiko said, this course is fantastic. I like the most that you teach us real English. Thank you, Ildiko. This is not classroom English, but real English by real American English speakers. Elaine in Brazil said that she joined the course to improve her English, but then something surprised her. She said, what surprised me even more was the wonderful community and the opportunity to meet and interact with so many friends from around the world. Love it. Well, let's test if the Fearless Fluency Club can actually help you to understand fast conversations and to speak confident English. My course uses the conversation breakdown method. This method helps you to catch the real meaning of conversations and be able to express yourself with the same type of expressions and terms and pronunciation so that you can be understandable. Today's YouTube video is just a short sample of the course. There are five modules in the full course and today you're only seeing half of one of the modules. So let's test the conversation breakdown method in the Fearless Fluency Club and let's meet Brandy. Hi everyone. Hello. I'm here with Brandy. Brandy is a real estate agent, realtor, but also a friend now. So uh, let's start by talking about the definition. What is a real estate agent <laughs> or <Okay>. realtor? <laughs> so a realtor and real estate agent are almost uh, interchangeable. Okay. So all real estate agents, in order to get on our listing service, which means the access to properties, we have to be a realtor, which is this organization mm -hmm. that has a set of ethics. Oh. And so we have to follow certain ethical guidelines to make sure that we don't mislead clients and we share all the important facts about a house. And when it comes to our activities, mm -hmm. we essentially are the, I like to think of myself as a consult, you know, mm -hmm. so um, I help consult people in buying and selling their home. 
Okay, so it is essential if someone wants to buy or sell a house that they, I don't know, contact a consult, a real estate <laughs> agent, a realtor to help them in that process. So technically, you know, people can buy and sell on their own. Oh. And if they want to, though I do think that working with a realtor, you have somebody who does it as a job mm -hmm. <laughs> and somebody who has seen you know hundreds of experiences of buying and selling and really understand how the market works what a good deal is what isn't a good deal yeah. what important repairs are what non-important repairs are yeah <laughs> so um so some people try and sell on their own and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and then they connect with a realtor to you know, engage their expertise um, and then for buyers uh, at least in our state and it's pretty common that um the seller pays the realtor commission for the buyers. So for buyers, the buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, the seller pays the commission. So it's beneficial for buyers especially. Yeah, I remember when we bought this house, we didn't, it didn't feel like we were paying you anything. It was so weird. Like you were helping us <laughs> so much and then there was no exchange of money. So if we had decided, hey, we're not gonna buy a house at all, mm -hmm. would you just be out then? Like you would have helped us all that time for nothing. <laughs> yes, and it happens a lot. Oh no! <laughs> oh, okay, but in the end, the expectation is that that person will buy and then you'll make a cut of whatever the price of the house is yes. that they got. Okay, because it seems like every country has a different way of dealing with buying property, but in the US, like it's pretty common to use a realtor who knows what they're doing. That's your job <laughs> yes. to know all those ins and outs, especially for us like as a first time buyer having no idea the process that like, it was so helpful <laughs> to have someone who was just guiding you especially when like we've got other stuff going on in our life I don't have time to know every detail about like who's the best person to sign these papers or what's the next step like it was really nice to have help so yeah thank you. <laughs> yeah you're welcome and I feel like my role too is also to like help make it as stress free as possible for mm. all parties mm. so you know as much as possible if a repair is needed and a seller um, doesn't have time to be there, like I'll meet the repair person at the house because p buyers and sellers, they have jobs, they have things mm. they have to do. And so if a buyer can't make an inspection because their schedule is really busy, I go to the inspection for them. Uh -huh. Of course, there's a report, um, though I want to be there to be able to help explain to them what's important, what's not important, those kind of things. So I feel like, you know, another job for a realtor is really just to make it as easy and as smooth as possible. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's a, like what a good realtor should do. <laughs> yes. Not all do that. <laughs> that's the ideal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so now that we kind of have a general overview, I'm curious about you personally, how did you get into this or why did you get into being a real estate agent? Yeah. So I was bartending. So I was uh, serving drinks at the Grove Park Inn, which is this beautiful resort in our area. Mm -hmm. And I met um, uh, this woman named Samantha and um, she was there with her team mm -hmm. and we just started talking and they were ordering a lot of drinks. <laughs> and <laughs> So they were talking a lot <laughs> and they were having a really good time. And we ended up <clears throat> talking a little bit and getting to know each other and I asked, well, you know, why are you here? Mm -hmm. You know, it's normally a question that I ask just to kind of engage um, customers. And she said, oh, we're celebrating a huge business success. Oh. And I was like, oh, well, what was that business success? Uh -huh. I want to know. And she's like, oh, well, we were the top, I was the top agent in all of um, Western North Carolina. And I was like, like top real estate agent? And she's like, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. I was like, how many houses did you sell last year? And she's like, 54. And I was like, that's a house a week almost. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's more than house a week, yeah. technically. So I was like wow and then I like I was like I think people make three percent and then house prices are like this and that's a lot of money uh -huh. <laughs> it's a pretty lucrative business like, especially if you do it well yeah I was like wow that's amazing and then I just kind of you know tap back into like my past and I always helped my dad and my mom like find their houses oh. like back in the day before the internet was as huge as it was I would look through like uh like there was like these flyers Oh. And I would look through the flyers and like highlight all the different properties for sale <laughs> or rent and like help my parents find them. Like I found my parents almost every house. Really? Yeah. Like I was like a 12 year old. <laughs> wow. So it is inside of you. Yeah. Destiny. I was like, I really, I loved this growing up. And mm -hmm. then I was like, if she can do it, you know, I don't like, she's nice and all, but I don't see that she has something that I don't have. So mm -hmm. I guess like 
it was just an opportunity for me to be like, I can do it too. Yeah. And so, um, long story short, I was actually seven months pregnant when I decided I wanted to do that. Great time to make a big life change. Yeah, and I already had one baby, so I was like, you know, it's now or never. Yeah. <laughs> like, while he's inside of me, it's going to be easier than mm. when he's not. So I signed up immediately for a real estate course. So I worked full time, uh, five days a week, Monday through Friday, mm. and then I would drive two hours away to go to real estate school Saturday and Sunday. <gasps> and so I did that for eight weeks, and then I graduated and I got my license eight days before I gave birth. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that just makes me a little stressed <laughs> thinking about it. I, so most people don't pass that exam on their first oh. try. It's well, you're really, like, this is it. I got to do it now. I was like, I, I literally don't have an option. Like, yeah. I would have, to, I can't do this with a one week old baby. Yeah. You know? And so I'm like, I'm just going to study super hard. Mm -hmm. And try not to panic in the test room. <laughs> but you and did it. I did it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So at that time, I guess talking with Samantha must have been just like a page turning that this is a new career. This is like a new option for me that I didn't know existed before or like didn't think about as a Yeah, I never really thought about it, you know, because like I, I owned my own business for a while. I was a yoga studio owner. And I loved that. And so I kind of just like, like, well, I'm just going to do that again eventually. And bartending mm. was just my like in-between um, since we had just moved from a different state. And then when I met her, I was like, you know, like, that sounds like a great thing to be able to support my family really abundantly. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I ended up joining her team because she, cool, she got my information as a good realtor does, you know, uh -huh. and followed up as a good realtor does. Yep. And she was like, oh, so are you thinking about buying a house? And I was like, actually, I'm a real estate school. <laughs> And she's like, oh, <laughs> you inspired me. I am here now. <laughs> she literally followed up while I was at school. Like I was on lunch break when she happened to call and I was like, oh, the universe. <laughs> it is crazy how, like if you have one real estate agent, they will like follow you throughout your life. Like my parents used to live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the house that they bought there when I was like two years old, when we moved to South Carolina, it's like even like 20 years later, they still would get Christmas cards from him. And it's like, we don't even live in the same state. You're like, this kind of networking connection to those people is insane. Especially if you're, I guess, like Samantha, like good at networking and mm -hmm. keeping up with potential customers, but also like in a friendly way. Yeah. Not just like, are you going to buy something? But like really just, yeah. And that's connecting. important. <laughs> yes, not being not too pushy. Because like, <laughs> I think a lot of people, that goes over their head. They're like, so, who do you know looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate? Yeah. That's <laughs> uh -huh. Well, I feel like something we, I really appreciated the first time we talked to you is we had we had also contacted Samantha when we were looking for a house. We, like, mm -hmm. stumbled upon her contact information and had talked with her, and we'd kind of been, like, looking for a place on and off for, like, a year just looking at listings and I think we'd driven by maybe like two places, maybe looked in a place mm -hmm. or two. But then when we talked to you, you're like, okay, this seems like something you really want. How about like next week you try to find three places that you like and we can walk in them and just see like, kind of get a real grasp for what you want after looking at like concrete places. And just that kind of wording to me felt like, oh, I'm kind of excited to like actually see places, even though I know not with a thought like, these are my three dream houses, but just like, we're going to analyze these places and see how you really feel about them. And that kind of felt to me less definite, like I have to find the perfect place and that's the only place I can look in. <laughs> like, oh, let's like look at these places and like get a real feeling for like how you feel about them instead of just, I felt like really serious. Like, I need to find the perfect place before I go in it. <laughs> it's like, I, I appreciated that, like not pushy, but like, let's just get a feeling for what mm -hmm. you really want. And I think that like helped us to get the ball rolling in a real way. Yeah. So yeah, that was really comforting. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, not that house hunters on HGTV, like our <laughs> network here should be like how we look at houses, but I think house hunters, oh, I, I loved that growing up. By the yeah. way. So, <laughs> I was obsessed with HGTV. I would watch like all these like weird home things. So I guess it was like in my blood, you know, like, yeah, I was like a teenager who does that anyways. <laughs> I stay up until midnight, you know? <laughs> like, 
<laughs> watching Curb Appeal. But anyways, um, so yeah, but on there, like what I learned too is that like people start, like when you look at different houses, you're like, oh, well, I like this and I don't like this and mm-hmm. I like this about this house, but not this house. And eventually, like after you see enough, you really start getting a feel. Mm. Um, I mean, you can also get to the point where you've seen too many and then it gets a little, you know, overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like if you just see a few, it starts to give you like an idea, like, like you said, like a concrete feeling yeah. of like, yes, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. I think we mm. saw one house that was gorgeous. Mm. It was a little bit higher price point, but you were just like, there's just something about the feeling of it. It's it feels too, too overwhelmingly big or that like sense yeah. that you get. It's a lot to like take care of for you guys. And so you yeah. were just like, when you found this one, um, you were like, oh, this is like perfect. It's nice. Though it's also like, it's, uh, it's concise. A- yeah, yeah. For it. it's not it's not big, especially for like an American mm-hmm. house. But it was a good step up from what we were where you we were before. You're in a tiny apartment. Yeah, I mean, so this is like a lot. This more is like space. double or more than double the space, which to us felt huge. The other one would have been like quadrupled. <laughs> yeah, and I think that is something to think about. Like, where yeah. are you now? Mm-hmm. What kind of lifestyle change will your new house? give you and do you want that (laughs) yes so yeah um so I'm curious uh I have already been through this because we were your clients Mm -hmm. but for students too a lot of people live in the U.S. and maybe would be in this process or don't live in the U.S. and have bought houses like in their own home country just to kind of compare from how the U.S. does it if I wanted to buy a house and I called you and said hey Brandy you're recommended to me I'm looking to buy a house what happens at that point? Like, what's the process that you would go through with someone? Gotcha. Well, first, like, um, I like to listen a lot in the Mm -hmm. very beginning because it's not about me, right? Um, It's about them and what they want. So the first thing that I do is, like, ask them a bunch of things. So Mm kind of just be ready to share with the realtor, you know, like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. So have, like, a list of, like, your needs and Mm -hmm. your wants and that kind of thing and be ready to go there. So, um, So that's the first thing that I do is, like, a thorough needs analysis And then the next step, and I honestly think that connecting with a mortgage lender after you talk to a realtor is a good idea Uh because the the realtor will be able to recommend a mortgage lender. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, because often like big banks and people that you bank with can be a little bit slower. They work on salary, not commission. Mm -hmm. So local lenders are typically more motivated to actually like help you and get you to closing. Whereas like big banks, they just work on a salary. They're not as motivated. Uh Um, And then so a realtor can sometimes recommend somebody that they work with a lot they work really well together they know that they're gonna you know hit the deadlines appropriately uh. not be late um, and then so getting that mortgage loan would be the next step and then once you're approved because you don't especially in our market I think it's like this globally right now it's just a really strong housing market in general um, uh. I don't know about globally but definitely within the continental U.S. right um, oh I guess U.S. and you know, Hawaii and Alaska are doing good too I have some <laughs> friends there Um, but anyways, so basically, you know, once you have that approval and you're ready to go, like literally could make an offer, that's when you start touring properties. Uh Um, drive-bys are great though. Honestly, in today's market, it really just depends. Like it might already be sold. Yeah. I'll drive by today and we'll make an offer tomorrow. No, let's just go today and offer today. Yeah. Because sometimes right now we're talking like in California, somebody, um, like people post in real estate groups that I'm in on Facebook Mm. and people are receiving 50 plus offers sometimes. That's crazy. I mean, just like an insane amount. So like you really want to get in there as soon as possible, um, (laughs) obviously. And then even here, like we're not that hot. um, But recently I've been involved in 11 offers. There's five offers. So it's still, it's a lot. It's a lot of competition. So it's good, at least right now in today's market, to move quickly. Um, Do you think like today's market means like post-COVID? Like that kind of has changed to make the market different? Like is that what you mean by like... Uh, the changing market, people leaving cities. And that's kind of what I imagine is like people want to leave New York City and move to the mountains to Asheville or something like that. Or is it just in general, like the way the world is this current yeah, moment? So I say, when I say today, I literally mean today because tomorrow there could be a political announcement that changes the market forever. Um, you know, like we don't know what tomorrow's market will look like quite literally. We don't know if the mortgage rates are going to go up because right now they're still at a historic low and uh-huh. they have been for 
a little while now. Um, so with rates being so low, it's a great time to get a mortgage. It's why so many people are buying. Like the interest rate? Interest rate, uh-huh. yeah. So the interest rate, like basically the amount that you pay now for a $300,000 house is significantly less than what you would have paid five years ago for a $300,000 house. Mm. So for the same amount of money, you're paying less per month. Because that percentage of interest is just so low, like yeah. over the 15 or 30 years. And so the monthly payments are a lot lower. I mean, mm. you're talking like sometimes really significant differences. Mm. You're talking 5% versus 3% over a 30 year time. It makes a really, really big difference, yeah. especially with those big numbers. Um, so yeah, so the market could shift, you know, there's some whispers of inventory rising because of the economy. Mm. Um, in the next few months, but people are also saying the economy will stay strong because the stock market's been doing well, so the wealthy have enough to purchase. Oh, so seems so complex. It's super <laughs> complex. That's why literally the market of today is the market of today. Uh-huh. And, you know, of course, it's probably tomorrow's market. Is it next week's market? I don't really know. Uh-huh. Um, so it can, it can change at any point. But as of right now, yes, post-COVID, a lot of people are moving from... Places that they disagree with their policies to places where uh, they agree with policies, both directions. Oh, if that makes yeah. Sense. Yeah. So, um, and not to get too political about it, but you know, when people want or like a certain policy in a certain region, they want to mm-hmm. live there. Yeah, that makes sense. You yeah. want to live near people who get you and you understand. And large acreage is also going really quickly now oh. because people are now seeing the value in having a bunch of space after maybe they've lived in an apartment for mm-hmm. the last year and been stuck in their apartment with whatever yeah. neighbors they have. I'm really glad I don't. That would so, be so tough. <laughs> yeah, with all the lockdowns and stuff, like I think it's really brought awareness to people's living situations and people mm-hmm. have realized they either love it or they don't. And yeah. I think most people after a year being stuck in one place are kind of like, you know, <laughs> I kind of want more space. Yeah. <laughs> and we live in the mountains oh, where terrible. <laughs> people are selling acreage, like they're selling big plots of land. The property I'm talking about, I was talking to her earlier today about was it's 150 acres. Mm. And so again, there's a lot of people wanting different chunks and different splits of this. And um, it's expensive, though also a lot of people want it because it's such a large tract of land. Yeah, that's like a whole mountainside. (laughs) It's literally a whole mountain. (laughs) Oh my goodness. With a creek and up and then the views like it's all cleared and it's, it's gorgeous. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. I mean, those kinds of things two years ago might have been less sought after. I mean, that sounds like a pretty unique situation, but like in general. No, it would have been because like there's an example, another property, it was a hundred acres. It was listed for seven fifty. Um, it's actually less than this one was listed for. Mm. And the views were incredible. And the house was like 10 times better. Like it was this beautiful old Victorian house and uh. it was super magical. And it sat on the market for years. What? And it just sold because the market's crazy now. But people it's like, didn't... that's what people want now. <laughs> yeah, but a few years ago, people were like, why do I want to live in the middle of nowhere with uh-huh. 100 acres, you know? <laughs> wow. And now people are like, please, yes. <laughs> that's so interesting. So, yeah, it can just change Yeah, very quickly. In a few months. Like, again, like years for that to sell. And then all of a sudden, they were getting so much interest, they ended up getting a really good price on it. So, yeah. Wow. That's so strange because I feel like if that is how people are feeling who are buying now. Like I, I remember like we felt like that even a year and a half ago, like, oh, is it just a bubble right now? Is it like really high price for the past or historically mm-hmm. or whatever? And are we going to like, are we just spending too much money? And then you never know what the and future holds. you just holds. found out you have like 20% equity essentially. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> But those things can always, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing. You, you don't, right? Because, like, at that time, in, uh, there was this meme that, like, it was basically, it was a skeleton on a chair, and it said, <laughs> buyers waiting for the market to crash. Oh, my goodness. Because, <laughs> like, you know, people keep saying that, like, oh, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, and uh-huh. it just keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and we're like, we don't know. That's why yep. it's today's market. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, so if you want it and you find the best thing for you, just do it. Just, like, yeah, especially with mortgage interest rates so low. Mm-hmm. And even if it does pop, if you're like planning on staying there a few years, it's going to go back up. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just how inflation works. Yeah. Essentially, the you know? market is always going to yeah. be changing and shifting. Yep. So at, let's say that you have a loan or a, the bank has said, I don't know the exact terminology, but the bank has said you're approved to buy a house for $300,000. You find mm-hmm. a house that's that much. Great. You want to buy it but there's like three other people who also want to buy it. 
like our situation, five mm-hmm. other people, whatever it was, what happens at that point? Because it seems like right now that's really common that you're going to have other people putting offers on the same house that you yeah. want. Like you fight it, duke it out. <laughs> what happens? So what's, what is stressful about those situations okay. is that like all the offers are blind. And so we had this conversation, mm-hmm. right? You know, what are other people going to offer? I don't know. How much do we want to offer? <laughs> yeah, and you know, there are terms um, other than cash that can be incentives. You know, um, but sometimes you don't want to waive those terms. And so an example would be like an inspection period. Mm-hmm. You know, like you found some things in the inspection, right, mm-hmm. that you wanted addressed, and they address them. Yeah, and um, that happens a lot. Like even if it's a great condition house, as this one was. Um, there's still going to be some items that you want fixed or repaired or might help you renegotiate from the price. Mm. So some people, um, in different states, it's different, by mm-hmm. the way. So very different. So we have an inspection period where you can choose three weeks, 30 days, whatever it is. And you uh-huh. can get as many inspections as you want. In other states, their rules are you have to choose what inspections you want up front. Oh, before you find out the results of the inspections. Yeah, oh, so like in stressful. other states, people are like, I'll waive all of the inspections because that's a part of their offer and their contract. Oh. Ours, luckily, is very different. Uh-huh. I I would be more stressed if it was that because yeah. like telling people to waive their inspection is, uh, it's risky on my end too, you know, because like I can be held liable if I encourage something and they find out something later. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so if it's multiple offers, obviously price is going to be the biggest factor that's going to motivate somebody. Emotion. Um, is another thing. So like the letter you wrote definitely helped and the pictures and stuff. Um, there's some like legal iffiness about that because technically like there's fair housing stuff that people could get in trouble for. Oh yeah, like you didn't like us because I have brown hair and like... Or skin color, you know, whatever yeah. people want to say about why they didn't choose them. So yeah. there's a little bit of like stuff with that, but I leave it up to the buyer to decide if they want to write a letter or not, Mm. you know, um, with keeping those things in mind. So So how did you enjoy that conversation with Brandy? Was it a little fast, a little tricky? Did you understand everything? Well, now you are going to get a vocabulary lesson where my husband, Dan, and I explain in detail some of the most important phrases from the conversation so that you can also use them in your daily life. You're also going to be able to see a short clip from the original conversation with Brandy so that you can see it in its original context. Let's get started with the vocabulary lesson. Welcome Welcome to to the the Fearless Fearless Fluency Fluency Club. Club. Vocabulary lesson. Today I'm here with my husband, Dan. Hello. And we're going to be explaining 17 useful daily English expressions that you heard in the conversation with Brandy. We're going to be going over these in detail and then you're gonna see a clip from the original conversation so that you can see the context and also get a better idea about how to use this yourself. Are you ready to get started? I'm ready. Let's do it. The first expression that we're gonna talk about is to be on one's own or to Mm. be on your own. And this means that you're doing something independently, without help, you're doing it by yourself. So for example, in the conversation with Brandy, most people use a realtor or a real estate agent to sell their house. But she said that some people try to sell their house on their own. Hmm. That means they do the marketing, they schedule all of the visits. It's just by themselves. They do it on their own. Before we talk about any other examples for this expression, I want you to notice the grammar. In the middle of this phrase, we can change one word. They did it on their own. Mm. I did it on my own. He did it on his own. Notice how the subject, I, matches the word in the middle. That's going to be our possessive pronoun. I did it on my own. He did it on his own. That always needs to match when you use this expression. Mm. All right, let's talk about some other examples for this phrase. How would you use this? Sometimes we say on your own Mm -hmm. or you're on your own. Mm -hmm. So If you say this to somebody else, likely you're maybe somebody's teacher. Hmm. So if you're teaching somebody how to do something and then you say, you're on your own, that means now it's time for you to do it by yourself, Hmm. independently. And I would say on your own or on my own often is a kind of good thing. Hmm. So for example, sometimes we say, I'm on my own now once you leave your parents' house. So if you lived with your parents and they took care of all sorts of things and then you move out 
and you have your own place and you do whatever you want, you could say, I'm on my own now. I'm responsible. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes though, too, it could just mean alone, mm -hmm. right? I was on my own on the way to uh, the park, walking through the woods. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say maybe this is a little less common. Yeah, I think it does have this sense of independence, maybe some freedom. As we said, uh, for a teacher, a teacher could say this, or someone who maybe is a boss telling the employees, okay, I have given you these skills, now you're on your own. So I can say this to you, after you watch this English lesson, you are on your own. That means I have given you the tools that you need to use these expressions, but now it's your choice. You mm. need to decide what to do with these expressions. Are you gonna just forget about it or are you going to write them down, write some sentences, use them with someone else in the course, this course, the Fearless Fluency Club. A lot of people speak together. They choose to find a Skype speaking partner or speak in a group on Zoom. This is a great way to use these expressions. So after this lesson, you are on your own. Mm. You need to be able to use this material yourself. We've given you the tools. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to the original clip from the conversation with Brandy so that you can see how it was originally used. Let's watch. So some people try and sell on their own and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and then they connect with a realtor. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. And the next expression is to pay out of pocket or mm -hmm out-of-pocket expenses and this means that you pay for something from your personal funds and this is almost always in a setting like in an organization or in a business or insurance mm. so what comes to my mind is if you work in a company and you go on a business trip a lot of times the company will pay for certain things maybe they'll pay for your travel maybe they'll pay for your food mm. But if you have to pay for it yourself in these situations, then you say, I had to pay for it out of pocket. Or maybe if you're on a business trip and you, you're with your clients and you buy them drinks, but the company doesn't pay for that, you could say, yeah, I paid for those drinks out of pocket. It was from my own money. Yes, or those were an out of pocket expense. Mm -hmm. We can imagine your own pocket or your own wallet and that's what you're paying from. You're not paying from the business's pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're paying from your own pocket. It's out of pocket. Mm -hmm. And like Dan said, we often use this in a business situation. This is really common in the US to use in an insurance situation. So your insurance will cover or will pay for certain things, but it might not pay for other things. So for example, maybe your insurance doesn't cover birth control. You might say, we need to pay for birth control out of pocket. Mm -hmm. This is a very common situation and you're talking about an organization, the insurance. You think they should cover this, but they don't. Mm -hmm. So you need to pay for it from your own personal money. Yeah. Or they may even list some things as out of pocket expenses. Mm. So stuff you just have to pay for yourself. You're yep. on your own, buddy. Yep, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to let you know that if you go to a bar with some friends, whenever we can do that again, and each of you pays for your own drink, you wouldn't say, I paid for my drink out of pocket. Yeah, because, this is just with your friends casually. Yeah, it's not, there's not a business that's paying for most of the expenses and then a little bit of it you're paying for it. We usually use this in a business situation or insurance. There might be some other situations where there is an organization paying for most of it, but a small percentage you need to pay out of pocket. You don't say out of my pocket, just out of pocket. All right, let's watch the original clips that you can see how it was used in the conversation with Brandy. Let's watch. So for buyers, the buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. The seller pays the commission, so it's the buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. The third expression that we're going to talk about is to make a cut. Is this talking about scissors or cutting something? Not really. This is a little more figurative. Mm -hmm. Usually this means that you're receiving part of the profits or the money from something. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the conversation with Brandy, when you hire a real estate agent, they you don't need to give them money immediately when you hire them. Instead, when you buy a house, they will receive a portion or part of 
the total amount of the house. Mm -hmm. So they'll get a bigger cut. If you purchase an expensive house, they'll get more money. If you purchase an inexpensive house, they'll get less money. So they receive a cut of the total price. So this mm -hmm. is a part of the amount. And this is pretty typical in sales situations. Maybe your business is like this. If you sell a lot of products, maybe you will receive a cut. Mm -hmm. You'll get some extra money because you sold more of those products. Yeah. I think this is a pretty casual expression. It sounds casual, mm. but we do use it in certain professional circumstances. For example, if you sell a product online and you get a portion of the of the proceeds, if you uh, sell something, mm. then you get a cut. And we do say that. Um, but other times I associate this with maybe like drug deals. Oh. So um, <laughs> if you help somebody do something kind of shady, like a drug deal, you get a cut of the profits or you get a cut of the drugs, mm. something like that. Maybe I've watched too many TV shows, but <laughs> I kind of associate it with that as well. But this kind of bleeds into all society as well. So mm. it's very common. Yeah. And you notice that we use to get a cut. You can mm -hmm. also say to make a cut. Both of those verbs are perfectly fine with this expression. Usually get in English is a little more informal and we use this in a lot of different situations but you can also say i made a cut on the sale of this expensive house because my clients bought an expensive house one situation that i want to mention that is pretty common and because uh, a lot of you watch youtube videos you often see people on youtube saying this is my favorite makeup uh, uh makeup <laughs> you should buy this makeup well this is an advertisement and they are receiving or they are making or they're getting a cut of the profit. So if you purchase that makeup, they will get a percentage, 10%, 20%, 50%, I don't know. So you have to, of course, trust the person. If that person is trustworthy and you think that they really love that product, they're not just doing it to get a cut, then, you know, it's worth buying. You can get it, but you need to make sure that they are trustworthy because they are making a cut. There is money here that's being exchanged when you purchase the product from their recommendation. Mm -hmm. They're making a cut. All right, let's watch the original clip from the conversation so that you can see how to use this fun expression, a cut. Okay, but in the end, the expectation is that that person will buy and then you'll make a cut of whatever the price of the house is. The expectation is that that person will buy and then you'll make a cut of whatever the price of the house is. The expectation is that that person will buy and then you'll make a cut of whatever the price of the house is. The next expression is lucrative. Mm -hmm. And this means that something or some activity produces wealth or money. Um, and usually we think of this as a lot of money. So it's kind of a polite way to say something can make you rich. Mm. For example, real estate. Now, a lot of people try to do real estate and it's a lot more difficult than they expect. Um, and they don't make a lot of money. So it's not lu lucrative for them. But if you're really good at real estate, you're really good at selling houses and you get a large cut from these million dollar houses that you're selling, well, real estate could be very lucrative. Mm. Or there's people who buy houses and then they fix them up and then they it's called flipping houses. So they mm. fix it and make it uh, better and then sell it at a profit. So that can also be very lucrative, but these are tricky things in the mm. real estate business. Yeah, it might not always be lucrative if you're not good at that business. Mm -hmm. So the word lucrative, like Dan mentioned, is a polite way to talk about lots of money because mm -hmm. In English, at least in the US, it's not very polite to say, I can make a lot of money with my business. Mm -hmm. I'm rich. This is very uh, proud or uncomfortable in conversation to say that. So when you say lucrative, it's a much more soft way, more indirect way to say, it's possible to make a lot of money mm -hmm. with my job. So you can kind of see when Brandy says this word, she's a little bit uncomfortable, but she uses that word lucrative instead of saying, I wanted to become a real estate agent because I wanted a lot of money. Yeah. You know, it's more polite to say, wow, I realized that real estate could be really lucrative if I did it really well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a more, a more polite way to talk about money. And I think it's understandable. We don't want to work a job where we don't make any money. Mm -hmm. We would like to 
get a job where we make more money or what's at least required for life. So I think that's a, a good word to be able to add to your vocabulary. All right, let's watch the original clip. You can see how the word lucrative was used. Let's watch. That's a lot of money. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a pretty lucrative business, oh especially if you do it well. Yeah, I was it's a pretty lucrative business, oh especially if you do it well. It's a pretty lucrative business, oh especially if you do it well. The next expression is to not have an option or to be out of options. Mm. This is a little bit self-explanatory and it means that you don't have a choice. Usually it's kind of desperate. Mm -hmm. You've tried everything and this is all that you have left. So for example, in the conversation with Brandy, she was talking about how she needed to finish real estate school before she had her baby. Because when you have a one week old baby, you can't go to real estate school. Mm -hmm. So she didn't have an option. She had to finish real estate school before she gave birth. She didn't have an option. Or we could say she was out of options. She mm -hmm. was out of options. This was the only thing that she could do finish real estate school now. Yeah. It's kind of a desperate thing that she was doing. Yeah, and this is a figurative expression, usually. Mm. Like, sometimes you literally don't have any options at all, but a lot of times, say, if you need a new job, you might have a selection of jobs, but you really want money right now, or you just don't know what's what the future holds, so maybe there's a job you don't really want to do, like, um, let's just say working at McDonald's. Not to rip on McDonald's employees, but you know, it's probably not on the top of people's lists. So you would say, I was out of options, I had to take the job at McDonald's. Well, maybe you did have a little bit of savings, um, but if you actually said that, you probably really don't have very much money. Mm -hmm. If you say, I'm out of options, I have to do X, Y, or Z. Yeah. That means that you're pretty desperate and you need to get a job now. Yep, you're out of options or I don't have an option, I have to do this. It's a good way to explain yourself if someone says, why did you take that job at McDonald's? You were working at Google last month. That was a great <laughs> job, it was a lucrative job. Why are you working at McDonald's now? You might say, well, I got fired or I lost my job. I because blew all of, my money at the casino. <laughs> because of the pandemic and now I'm out of options. I have to get a job at McDonald's for mm. the next couple months until I find something else. Mm -hmm. So this kind of desperate plea. All right, let's watch the original conversation so that you can see how I don't have an option or I'm out of options was used with Brandy. Let's watch. Yeah, well, you're really... like, this is it. I gotta do it now. I was like, <laughs> I, I literally don't have an option. Yeah. Like, I would have, to, I can't do this with a one week old baby. Yeah. I, I literally don't have an option. I, I literally don't have an option. I, I literally don't have an option. Yeah. The next expression is a page turning or to turn the page and turning pages, anything with pages in a book, these kinds of expressions, if we're using it in the figurative way, and depending on the context, you'll understand that this means that there was a big change in your life, or that it was very sudden. Mm -hmm. So for example, Brandy was talking about when she decided to become a real estate agent, she had talked to another real estate agent, and Vanessa said that moment was a page turning. So that means that oh, I'm doing this one thing and now I'm gonna change my life completely and do something else. It was a page turning. But she could have also said, um, Brandy turned the page on that chapter in her life, mm -hmm. being a bartender. Now she's a real estate agent. Yeah, we can use this in a very poetic, beautiful, figurative way, but it's a great thing to talk about, to use when you're talking about a, a big event that changes your life. Maybe getting married, having a baby, moving to a new city, uh, changing your job, or deciding to learn English. Hmm. Maybe you could say, when I found Vanessa's lessons, it was like a page turning in my life. I decided that I was excited about English. I hope that's true for you. <laughs> or you might say, I decided to turn a page in my life and start to learn English and enjoy it instead mm. of feeling that kind of stress and anxiety about studying grammar. I decided to turn a page in my life. Mm. There is one little bonus expression I would like to add, and sometimes in these situations we say to turn a new leaf. Mm. You can imagine a leaf on a tree. We don't exactly turn a leaf over, but sometimes we say 
we use the word leaf to talk about a page. Mm -hmm. This is kind of an old fashioned word to talk about pages, like um, the, the leaves of the book. <laughs> we don't really use that in daily conversation anymore, but that is an old fashioned way to talk about a page. So you will mm -hmm. hear people say, I'm ready to turn a new leaf. I'm going right. to leave my job and find a new career. Right. This that, is a total change. Yes, and I was going to add that that's another way we use this. If you say, I'm ready to turn the page mm -hmm. or ready to turn the leaf, mm -hmm. this means that you want to make the change. So it hasn't already happened yet. Mm -hmm. So maybe um, you just had a breakup with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you say, I'm just ready to turn the page on this feeling or relationship. Mm. Um, I'm over it. I'm ready to move on. Yes, you can turn a new leaf and begin a new life. <laughs> well, I hope that your journey with English is like that, that you are ready to turn a new leaf, to turn the page on your English journey and really take a hold of your learning. You can do it. All right, let's watch the original clip from the conversation with Brandy so that you can see how this was used in our conversation. Let's watch. Wow, so at that time, I guess talking with Samantha must have been just like a page turning that this is a new career talking with Samantha must have been just like a page turning talking with Samantha must have been just like a page turning that the next expression is to go over one's head or to go over my head we often use this expression with our hand mm -hmm. it went over my head this means and you make a whooshing sound Oh, really fast. <laughs> this means that you didn't understand something. Maybe it was too complicated. Maybe there was some kind of joke. This is often used with a joke yes. that you don't understand. Maybe someone's speaking English and it's too fast. If someone is speaking really fast and you just don't understand what they're talking about because they're just going on so quickly and they're talking about stuff that you don't know. Maybe this is Vanessa. Well, you might say, I didn't understand anything Vanessa said. It just went over my head. Mm -hmm. We can imagine the words flying over your head. Mm -hmm. This is a really common expression to talk about. I just didn't understand it. Yeah. Uh, the, it went over my head. I usually think of this expression being used with a joke. Mm. So when you're in school, people use this all the time. So sometimes they literally just say the joke. They don't even finish the expression. <laughs> so if somebody doesn't understand, you say the joke or you're, uh, sometimes it's kind of mean if you're making fun of somebody mm. and they're like, what, what are you talking about? Mm. You could say the joke just went right over their head mm. or the joke went over your head. And I guess you usually say that to other people, not that person. But mm. anyways, so it's often used for a joke. Other times it could be used for um, maybe a complex science or math problem mm -hmm. so for me big math problems that i did in high school uh, my dad would be trying to help me with these math problems and i could just say um yeah this is over my head mm -hmm. these math problems are over my head i don't understand it it's beyond where i can reach mm -hmm. beyond my understanding that happened to me a lot too hmm. both of our dads are engineers <laughs> and they understand complex math problems that normal people like us don't understand for some reason i was taking calculus i don't know why <laughs> oh, that sounds very complicated <laughs> but even for more simple math classes my dad would try to explain things to me too and so many times it just went over my head. He tried so hard to explain it and I'm sure he was doing a great job of explaining it. My brain just wasn't ready to accept that information yet. It went over my head. So if you're in this kind of situation where you're speaking in English with someone else or you're having a dinner and everyone's speaking in English and uh, someone says a joke and you don't get it, well, if you have a friend in that group, you could say, hey, that joke went over my head. Can you explain it? Or <laughs> I didn't understand that joke. It just went over my head. You can use this expression to say, I didn't understand. I didn't get it. Could you help me? And if you would like to understand some jokes in English, I have a couple videos on YouTube where I talk about some popular jokes in English, and I will try to uh, link those for you so that you can immerse yourself in some English humor. <laughs> All right. Let's watch the original clip from the conversation with Brandy. I hope that her expression will not go over your head. I hope you'll be able to understand it. And let's watch. Yes, not being not too pushy. Be like pushy, because I think a lot of people that goes over their head. They're like, so who do you know looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate? Because I think a lot of people that goes over their head. Because I think a lot of people that goes over their head. Like, the next expression is to get a feeling for something 
which we often shorten to get a feel for something. And this means to get a sense of something, get some experience. For example, I used to work in a coffee shop and when you first look at an espresso machine, you just feel really confused. You're like, how does this thing work? You have to get a feel for it. You have to practice on it or, um, you know, explore it, look at the different buttons, mm -hmm. watch somebody do it. Um, getting these kinds of experiences with something helps you get a feel for that thing. In my example, the espresso machine at the coffee shop. Mm, yeah. So in this situation, Dan is getting a feel for a physical item. Yeah. Sometimes literally. Yeah. Getting a feel for the espresso machine. Mm -hmm. But in the conversation with Brandy, I used it in a more emotional way. Mm -hmm. So when Dan and I were looking for a house that we wanted to buy, it felt really overwhelming. There was just a lot of options. We felt really picky about what we wanted. And when we first talked to Brandy, she said, all right, let's just check out a few houses that you think are okay. They don't need to be perfect. Let's get a feeling for what you like and mm -hmm. what you don't like. And then we can go from there. So it wasn't so definite. You have to find the perfect house. No, let's just get a feeling for what you like. In this way, we're actually talking about our emotions, a mm -hmm. feeling. Let's, let's try to see, do I like this house? Do I not like this house? What do I not like about it? So we're talking about our feelings. So in this more emotional sense, you can use, I'm, I got a feeling about the house or I got a feel. You can mm -hmm. use both in this emotional sense, but in the physical sense that Dan talked about, get a feel for the espresso machine we would really only use feel, mm -hmm. not a feeling. Get a feeling for the espresso machine. That kind of sounds like you, you're you thinking, should I fall in love with the espresso <laughs> machine? Do I have a feeling, an emotion? It's, we're not talking about emotions. We're just talking about your experience yeah. and trying to learn how to use it. Perhaps a single word that can explain this is test. Mm. It's like a small test. Mm. You're testing how you feel when you see these houses. Yeah. You're testing out the espresso, ma espresso machine and mm. feeling how it works. Yeah. So we would say to get a feel or to get a feeling. All right. Let's watch the original clip from the conversation with Brandy. And you can see how I used it in this positive way, talking about our first experience when we first met Brandy a long time ago. All right. Let's watch the clip. I, I, I appreciated that, like not pushy, but like, let's just get a feeling for what mm -hmm. you really want. And I think that like helped us to get the ball rolling. Let's just get a feeling for what mm -hmm. you really want. Let's just get a feeling for what mm -hmm. you really want. And I the next expression is a bunch of something. Mm. We often pronounce this a bunch of, a bunch of something. And it's a kind of casual way to say a lot. Maybe it's like a little bit less than a lot. Mm -hmm. So in the conversation with Brandy, she says, when I get to know someone, when I first meet a client, I ask them a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's 30 questions, maybe there's 10 questions, but she asks them kind of a lot of I'm questions. I'm gonna say more than three. All right, Dan's official answer is, is more than three. Maybe four. <laughs> this is not a, a strict number. Yes. But it's the general sense that it's not a little bit, it's not a, a lot, but it's just a casual way to say kind of a lot. Yes, that's the casual way. Mm -hmm. I believe technically a bunch means a group of similar things. Mm -hmm. For example, a bunch of bananas. Mm -hmm. So literally the the bunch of bananas that you buy in the store, that's what it's called. It's a bunch. A bunch of so bananas. So mm -hmm. the group of bananas, they're all the same thing. It's a bunch of bananas. Mm -hmm. But again, we use this much more casually just to mean a lot more than four. Okay, more than four. So if you're going to plant a garden, like what we're doing, you might go to the plant nursery. The plant nursery is a store that sells little tiny plants or seeds or something. You could go to the plant nursery and say, whoa, there are a bunch of options. Mm. There are a bunch of plants here. I don't know which vegetable I should buy. There's so many tomatoes. There are a mm. bunch of different tomatoes that I could buy. So we're talking about just a large quantity, usually of something in the same group, like a bunch of plants, like Dan said, a bunch of bananas, a bunch of options. This can be used in a lot of different ways, but it's a great word to add to your vocabulary because we use it in conversational English all the time. Oh, and I just remembered, sometimes we just say bunches. Oh, okay, can you explain that? When would you say that? Well, I, it's, is it improper English, technically? 
It seems no, kind of like the wrong way to say it, but uh, if you have a lot of something, you can just say, I have bunches. <laughs> yeah, maybe this isn't the most proper thing to yeah. say. But it's like it's... what kids say a lot of times. Oh. I, I have bunches of toy cars. Oh, okay. I've got bunches. Yeah, maybe if you, <laughs> if Dan asks, how many plants did you buy at the nursery? And I say, bunches. <laughs> it's kind of a, a silly way. Maybe that's yeah. just, if you're going to use it as an adult, you kind of use it in a joking way mm -hmm. because it's not perfect grammar, but you're going to use it in kind of a silly way. Oh, I, I bought bunches. You won't believe it's just piles <laughs> yeah. of plants. I got so many <laughs> bunches. So it could be in kind of a joking way too. Yeah. Well, that's a fun way to add it. <laughs> All right. Let's watch the original conversation so that you can see how the word a bunch of was used. Let's watch. So the first thing that I do is like ask them a bunch of things. So mm -hmm. kind of just be ready to share with the realtor, you know, like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. So the first thing that I do is like ask them a bunch of things. So, so the first thing that I do is like ask them a bunch of things. So the next expression is post. And we mean post as in the prefix to some word or expression. So this means after something, usually some kind of event. So a very common way to say this is post-war. So mm -hmm. this means after the war. So po post-World War II America. Mm -hmm. So um, this is usually the time after the war, not when the war is going on. Mm -hmm. So po post-World War II America saw a baby boom. Mm -hmm. Lots of babies were born when the soldiers came home. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it also means this thing is still going. Uh, for example, sometimes casually you might say, my life post kids has been crazy. <laughs> so this means that um, once you had children, after that time, life got really crazy for you. Yeah, you still but, have kids. But it doesn't mean the kids went away, even though you said post kids. It just means after they were born. Yeah, so this expression is a little bit vague about mm -hmm. whether the event is still continuing or not, because when we talk about, when we use this with war, like Dan said, post-World War II. Post-World War II, there was a baby boom in America. That means definitely World War II is over. Everyone will understand that this means World War II is finished when the baby boom happened. But when you say, yeah, post-kids, my life has changed a lot, that doesn't mean my kids are gone, my kids are finished, it just means <laughs> My kids were born and now my life is different. So a page turned <laughs> when my kids were born and our life is a lot different. So we just could say in that situation, post kids. Now the opposite of this is pre, pre kids. We had a lot more free time. <laughs> what did I even do in my free time? I don't even know. <laughs> pre kids or pre World War II, pre some event. And that mm. means definitely before the event. But in the conversation, we used post. We talked about post-COVID. Mm. And this, co one's a, this one's a little unclear. I yeah, think. because COVID is not finished, at least when we had this conversation. COVID is not over. Hopefully it's finished now. I don't know. This is gonna, you're going to see this in just a, a couple weeks. So. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about that. But we're talking about an event, COVID, the pandemic, that's still continuing. And we are in the middle of it. So post-COVID... The world has changed a lot. Post-COVID, people have moved into different areas of the U.S. So this is like during the period of COVID, not when COVID is finished. So it's a little bit unclear, but I think that you can kind of get a general sense that it's after an event or after an event has started. All right, let's watch the original clip from the conversation so that you can see how we used this to say post-COVID. Let's watch. But as of right now, yes, post-COVID, a lot of people are moving from places that they disagree with their policies to places where uh, they agree with policies. Post COVID, a lot of people are moving. Post COVID, a lot of people are moving. The next expression is to duke it out. And like you can see from Dan's example here, it means to fight. This could be a physical fight or it could be a verbal fight mm -hmm. where you're just arguing about something. You're duking it out. So you're fighting with someone. This expression has a very strange and complex origin mm -hmm. because the the phrase to duke it out is very american it's pretty much exclusively used in the u.s but the origin came from london in the uk uh, as far as i remember i did the research duke is a slang word for your hands your hands and 
then it kind of turned into to fight, to duke it out with your hands. It, it seemed a little bit complicated. Right. Well, <laughs> it originally came from Cockney slang. Is that what it's called? Cockney? Cockney rhyming slang. So Cockney, Cockney is rhyming like an slang. accent. An accent so in the UK. So it was, they would say Dukes of York for forks, but <sighs> then somehow forks became your fingers, and then somehow your Dukes and forks, or Dukes and Yorks or something became just dukes. hands and fingers. <sighs> Anyways, somehow in the end, dukes <laughs> became your fists, your hands. It's a long historical it's a story. <laughs> tale. Yeah, but it's quite interesting if you want to do any research about Cockney rhyming slang. This is a historical type of uh, way of speaking in a certain area in London, and they had a, ter a certain type of slang or rhymes that they would use so some interesting expressions came from that type of slang even american expressions like yes. this and i think the original thing they would say is put up your dukes oh okay to put fight. up your dukes put up your dukes and fight me <laughs> but in america somehow we turned it into duke it out yeah so let's talk about some physical ways we can use this and more figurative like verbal ways we can use mm -hmm. this How... so yeah the most literal way is a fist fight mm -hmm. literally just fighting punching each other that's literally duking it out yeah. but we often use this for verbal debate mm. especially one-on-one -on -one. so mm. if you're arguing with just one person and you're like yelling at them or even in america we have presidential debates you could even say that they're duking it out mm. they are duking it out on tv mm. they're having a debate and everybody's watching and you know, they're adversaries. They're not friends. Mm, yeah, they're not maybe yelling, but they are kind of arguing. They're having this kind of fight, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But we can also just say, yeah, those two guys at the bar, they got drunk and they just duked it out. They just fought and yeah. this is kind of a very uh, <laughs> violent physical thing. All right, let's watch the original clip from the conversation so that you can see how Duke It Out was used. And that you're gonna have other people putting offers on the same house that you yeah. want. Like, you fight it, Duke It Out. <laughs> that you yeah. want. Like, you fight it, Duke It Out. <laughs> that you yeah. want. Like, you fight it, Duke It Out. <laughs> the next expression is an idiom, and it is up front. Mm. And this means at the beginning or usually telling somebody something at the beginning before a process happens, mm. or it means direct and honest. Mm. So they're actually kind of similar. So I'll start with the first one. So um, Brandy was talking about during a real estate agreement with the owners of a house. In some places you have to get the inspection chosen up front. So that mm. means at the very beginning, you need to choose the inspector and then tell the owners who that inspector is. Mm. Other places you don't have to do that. So you don't have to tell them up front who you're going to get to inspect the house. Mm. So this is kind of a technical way she used it, but you kind of get the idea that at the beginning, up front, you need to choose the inspector. But in all, even that one kind of has the same meaning as being up front, as in direct or honest. Mm. Kind of has to do with honesty. Both parties know what's going on up front. Yeah, in the very beginning, you know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So actually in the conversation with Brandy, I think it was even more specific than knowing who's going to do the inspection. It was which inspections are you gonna do? Uh, so okay. you've never seen the house, you haven't looked at it, you don't know about the problems, but you have to choose, I want the basement inspected, I want uh, an like a, a termite inspection. I want the roof inspected. Okay. But maybe you don't know that there's an electrical problem and you didn't choose the electrical inspection up front. Well, that's a problem because when you buy the house, if you buy the house and there's an electrical problem, well, that's your fault because you didn't choose the right inspections up front. Mm -hmm. So this means at the very beginning. But like Dan said, we often use this to mean direct or honest communication. So, for example, when you purchased this course, I hope that I was upfront with you. I hope that it was very clear and I was direct and honest with you that this is not one-on-one -on -one speaking lessons. You will not be booking lessons with me on Skype. I try to be very clear about this, that you will receive a lesson set material, these lessons, and you'll have the chance to speak together with other members. Once a month, you have a chance to speak with me, but it's kind of a, a different situation. This is not one-on-one -on -one lessons. So for 
your sake and for mine, I need to be up front with you. Mm -hmm. So if you are working at a business, you might say this too. It's important to be up front with your clients. You need to mm -hmm. tell them exactly what they can expect, exactly what your product is. You need to be direct and honest. Right. It's that idea at the beginning, you need to present the information, mm -hmm. not after a while, but you need to be up front. Yeah. That's kind of the sentence construction right. here. And on the flip side, if you say somebody's not being up front, mm -hmm. that means that they're hiding something, yeah. that they're not being honest. He's not being up front with me. I think he, he has some dirty secret. Mm. Maybe let's say you're in a relationship with a girl or a boy. You could say they're not being up front with me. I think they're chatting with somebody else on their phone. Oh. Who is that? Mm. Mm. Yeah, or maybe if you have been on a couple dates with someone and then after you know the first couple dates, they pull out a cigarette and start smoking. <laughs> you might think, oh, he wasn't up front with me that. about his smoking habit. That would have changed how I thought about him. So he wasn't up front with me. Or if you want to be up front with someone, you could say, all right, I want to be up front with you and let you know that occasionally I do smoke. I smoke a pack a day. I drink <laughs> six pack of beer. Um... <laughs> Here's all of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> or you can just tell someone something that you think might be useful information to them. I want to be up front with you that occasionally I do smoke. I have some anxiety and this helps me to relieve it but I'm working on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're just telling them directly and honestly something that they might find useful yeah. or informative. Usually it's kind of challenging information. Yeah, yeah, but it's important to be upfront in a relationship. Mm -hmm. I think that helps uh, solid, healthy relationships. <laughs> All right, let's watch the original conversation so that you can see how upfront was used. In other states, their rules are you have to choose what inspections you want upfront. Oh, before you find out the results of the inspections. Their rules are you have to choose what inspections you want up front. Their rules are you have to choose what inspections you want up front. How did you enjoy that vocabulary lesson? Now it's time for grammar, phrasal verbs. You are going to be learning some of the most important phrasal verbs from the conversation with Brandy so that you can use them yourself. In the full Fearless Fluency Club phrasal verb lesson, there is an extra material section for each phrasal verb where I explain some movie clips, TV show clips, and song clips that use the phrasal verbs. This is a great way to see the phrasal verbs in real life contexts. But unfortunately, here on YouTube, I can't add those clips because of copyright problems. So I'm sorry if the editing seems a little bit choppy. I had to cut off that section. But if you join the full course, you will be able to see that part. All right, let's get started with the phrasal verb lesson. Welcome to the Fearless Fluency Club grammar lesson. Today, I'm here with my husband, Dan. Hello. And we're going to be talking about some phrasal verbs that you heard in the conversation with Brandy. These phrasal verbs are commonly used in daily conversation, so I hope that it will help you to understand daily conversation, but also be able to integrate them into your own speaking and daily life. First, Dan and I are going to be explaining the phrasal verb meaning, and then we're gonna to go to an extra material section. During that extra material section, I'm going to be explaining some movie clips TV show clips, song clips, and also the clip from the original conversation so that you can get a broader context for the phrasal verbs because we often use them with a different intonation or just a slight different look in our eyes that makes it mean something different and you'll be able to see that in those TV and movie clips. So let's get started with the definitions and some general ideas and then we'll move on to that extra material section. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. The first phrasal verb that we're going to talk about is to think about. You might think that this phrasal verb is pretty straightforward, that maybe you're just using your head, you're thinking, but there are some nuances in this expression that I want you to understand. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we use phrasal verbs in conversation, they replace textbook words. So you might have learned the word reflect. Hmm, sometimes I reflect on my childhood. Mm -hmm. Or, hmm, I need to consider all of the options. Consider, reflect. These are great words, but they're often a little too formal for daily conversation. So instead, we often exchange words like this for a phrasal verb. And we can do that with the word think about. Mm -hmm. So we could say, 
yesterday I was thinking about my first experience going to the movie theater and I can't believe my parents let me watch The Matrix mm -hmm. when I was six years old. Here we can exchange reflect. I was reflecting on my first experience well, at the movie theater. This isn't mm -hmm. true. I did not see The Matrix when I was six <laughs> years old. But this is the idea of exchanging a phrasal verb to think about to sound more natural and more comfortable instead mm -hmm. of reflect. This kind of high level, maybe more uh, formal type of word. Right. So, so can... Or you could use it in the past tense. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought about it. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to the movies and I was going to watch this movie with my friends, but then I thought about mm. all the other scary movies mm. I watched, and I thought about how scared I was. So you're kind of thinking back, reflecting mm -hmm. on the past. Yes, so we can start by thinking about this, thinking about <laughs> this phrasal verb, and we use it so much. That's the second way. Yes, in the past, I was thinking about something, you're reflecting on something, but let's take it to the present. If we give a statement, a fact, like uh, when you are in a relationship you should think about your partner. Oh, okay. What? <laughs> you should consider your partner. Mm -hmm. So this is using it, uh, exchanging think about with a different word, consider. I should think about Dan's perspective. What is his experience in our relationship like? What is his experience like? I should think about Dan. It doesn't mean I need to sit on the couch and think, oh, Dan, Dan. I'm thinking, Dan is in my head, Dan. No, this means I'm considering, <clears throat> I'm being thoughtful about his experience. Yes. You should think about your partner. Yeah, sometimes this is like a command or a suggestion. Mm. Mm. So if you want somebody to think more, mm. you could say, think about what you're doing. Oh. So this really makes people stop and think, what am I doing? Mm. Think about what you're doing. Uh -huh. Or think about how I feel when you don't wash the dishes at night. <laughs> we always use dishes as an example. It's a very classic couple situation, right? Right. So you're asking somebody to consider hmm. this problem or issue or anything, really. Yeah. I think that this is a common uh, type of command in close relationships. So maybe in your marriage or with your kids, sometimes authorities will say this to someone under them. So parents could say this to children. Teachers could say this to their students. Um, Think about your actions. Yes, and it think could, about what you did wrong. <laughs> it could also be hypothetical, mm. like think about the children. Oh, <laughs> can you explain this? Because this is kind of digging a little this deeper. Is almost a meme to the point of being a joke. If you say think about the children, <laughs> that's like saying uh, this thing that's happening in society. Let's say you really hate a certain kind of music, and mm. the girls are dancing like crazy, mm. you know, and showing their stuff. <laughs> well, you might say, think about the children. There's children watching this. Mm. So it's kind of this whole big picture, stop and think about what you're doing. Mm, sure. But so, in a more hypothetical, uh, maybe large scale sense. Yeah. Yeah. We could say, think about the environment. Mm -hmm. Think about the future. These type of big ideas. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the past and the present. What about the future? If I said to you, I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. I'll think about it. I will think about it. This is the future. I will think about it, not now, but later. So <laughs> I'll think about it. Yeah, that expression has a lot of uh, meaning mm. kind of baked in. If you say, I'll think about it, sometimes this means that you're very serious, like you actually will. But a lot of times when we say, I'll think about it, that means that you are just telling them yes now, but you're probably going to say no later. Yeah. This is very common to say, like, if somebody asks you, oh, Sarah's having a party on Friday. Do you want to come? If you probably don't want to go or, yeah, you really don't want to go, mm -hmm. it's polite to say, I'll think about it. But that person knows that if you don't show up, they're not surprised. Yeah, because you already didn't show strong interest. You're not like, yeah, I'll clear my schedule. No, yeah. it's not like that. I'll think about it. Yeah, so there is kind of an underlying tone of, I don't want to be negative right now. I don't want to say no. So instead, I'll be indirect and just say, I'll think about it. So mm -hmm. you could be serious and say, okay, I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes this also means, no, I'm already just, I've already decided no, but I don't want to tell you that directly right yeah, now. Yeah, I think if you want to be more serious, a lot of times... Like if there's a problem, you might have, you might say something like, 
I'll have to think about that oh. or I'll have to think about it. That's a good And point. that makes it sound a little bit stronger when you say I'll have to. Mm. Just kind of a different emphasis. Yeah, a yeah. A lot of it depends on your tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that if you said, uh, oh yeah, I'm having a birthday party this weekend and you're invited, do you think you can come? I might say, I'll think about it. And that means probably not. But if I said, oh, I'll have to think about it. Yeah. Or that kind of means I'm a little more serious. You want to qualify though. Like, oh, I'm really busy, uh, but I'll have to think about it. Mm. I would like to. You'd like add a lot more if you were serious. Yeah. And you notice that a lot of times here we said it. I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. We sometimes just leave it as that. Instead of saying, I'll think about if I can go to your party. I'll think about whatever that situation might be. Instead of repeating it and saying it, we just stick with the phrase, I'll think about it. And it's very clear and simple to say this. So what we're going to do next is we're going to go to an extra material section where you're going to see a bunch of different situations that use this phrase from movies, TV shows, songs, also the conversation with Brandy. I hope that it will help you to kind of dive deeper and understand the different situations so that you can use this yourself. And also if someone says it to you, you invite them somewhere and they say, I'll think about it. <laughs> you really know what they're saying. Yeah. So I hope this will help you gain a deeper understanding. All right, let's go to the extra material section. In this extra material section about the phrasal verb to think about, we're going to take a look at six different clips. Actually, it's eight clips, but three of them we're going to put together. The first one is from the conversation with Brandy. The next few are from movies or TV shows. And the final one is from a famous song. So let's start with the conversation with Brandy. We were talking about how Brandy had never thought about real estate as a future career for her. So in the conversation, we said, this is a new option for me that I didn't know existed before or like didn't think about as a path. So this is something that she didn't consider as an option for her future because she's talking about the present. This is just a statement. I didn't think about that. This is something that she didn't consider. This is like a new option for me that I didn't know existed before or like didn't think about as a Yeah, I never really thought about it. Or like didn't think about as a Yeah, I never really thought about it. Or like didn't think about as a Yeah, I never really thought about it. The next phrasal verb is to follow up. Hmm. And this can also be used as an adjective or a noun, but we'll talk about that at the end of this section. So first, we're going to talk about the more literal meaning, which isn't used as often. Hmm. So we're going to be focusing on the more figurative meaning, which is more common in daily conversation. But if I said that a famous singer, who's a famous singer, uh, Taylor Swift hmm. had a really popular album, this means like a bunch of songs. She had a really popular album and then she followed that up with a less popular album. Mm. What would that mean to you? So this sounds like it just literally means the next thing. Mm. But usually if we say followed up with, that means it's like something extra or surprising mm. or maybe it's like an event, right? So uh, we followed up the big party with another party at my house. <laughs> so you're just having a partying night. So this is kind of like extra. Mm -hmm. If you're saying the next thing we did was mm -hmm. something a little more than usual, then we could use follow up. Yeah. If you're just giving someone a list of things to do, like to make bread, you need to put the flour in the bowl. You need to, then you need to pour in the water. You can't say, <laughs> then you need to follow up with sugar. Yeah. You wouldn't, no. you wouldn't say it in this way because it's not something surprising or more. It, it doesn't really have that sense. So mm. when we use it in the more literal sense to follow one event with another event, to follow up an event, mm. it has to be surprising or a little bit more. So that's what we mean about the, the literal meaning. But I want to focus more on the figurative sense mm -hmm. because this is the one that's used more commonly in daily conversation. Mm -hmm. What if I said to you, hey, can you give Sam a call? He never finishes his projects on time. Can you follow up with him? Mm. Mm. Or you need to follow up on him. Mm -hmm. even. You might say on him in mm. that situation, like if you're somebody's boss, right? Um, what does this mean in general? It means that you need to check in on somebody. You mm -hmm. need to make sure that they're doing 
the right thing, or maybe you had told them that you are going to talk to them later. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times if you say, oh yeah, um, I'll, I'll get back to you on this problem or this project, well then you're, if you follow up on that, you're going to either call somebody back. Mm -hmm. A lot of times this is used with the phone. Mm -hmm. I need to follow up on John and see how the project's going. Mm -hmm. Beep, I'm following up right now. So you wouldn't say that, but that is an act of following up. Mm. And I can only think of phrasal verbs, really, checking in on somebody, <laughs> making sure they're okay. Yeah, I would say that this is contacting someone mm -hmm. to get additional or more information. At the base, that's kind of what you're doing. You're seeing, are they finished with the project? How is it going? Um, you're, you realize that something should be happening or is happening and you want to contact them to get more information about it. So what if I said, can you follow up with him? Mm -hmm. Can you follow up on him? Can you follow up on the project? Or let's follow up about the project. There are a lot mm. of prepositions that can be used after this phrasal verb. And there's a couple different uh, rules. They're maybe not strict rules, <laughs> but conversational rules for which preposition we use at which time. And I know that prepositions can be really tricky for English learners. I mean, for me, um, as I've been learning French, my second language, prepositions are also tricky in French. So maybe they are for people learning your language too. <laughs> so let's try to specify when can you say follow up with, is it someone or something? What do you think? It could be either one. Yes, so I'm gonna yeah. follow up with the project mm -hmm. or follow up with him. Mm -hmm. It's a little more, um, I'd say, gentle than follow up on. Mm. So if you're following up on somebody, you're kind of in charge. Mm. Or if I'm following up on a project, it means it's important and you need to get it done. Mm. But if you're following up with, I think that sounds a little more gentle. Like maybe you're in a team project or, mm. um, Maybe you have an appointment or something. It's just a little bit different. Yeah, and what about following up about a project? I'd say that's used the least. Mm, I think like maybe if you're talking to somebody about something mm. at that moment, like if you're introducing something to somebody on the phone, mm. like, hey, John, I just wanted to follow up about the project. Mm. That's kind of the situation you would say yeah. about. When you're introducing, why are you calling? Well, I'm following up about something. And I was trying to think about why, think about, to use our other phrasal verb, why we don't use to follow up about in a question. Because it sounds okay to say, I'm following up on the project. Um, it sounds okay to say, I'm following up about or on the project. But if you say, can you follow up on the project? Great. Can you follow up about the project? It feels a little bit weird. So the conclusion that we came to <laughs> is that you can't really use follow up about something in a question. It's more of a statement about why you're contacting someone. So mm. if I called Dan and said, hey, Dan, I just wanted to follow up about the project. I just wanted to follow up about the project. It's a statement. It's not a question. Um, but if I was asking Dan to do that, I could say, hey, can you follow up on the project? Mm -hmm. Hey, can you follow up with Sam about the project? So it's not really used in a question form, which is something that is maybe a little bit tricky if you haven't thought through all of those things. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> I also want to talk about how we can use follow up as an adjective and as a noun. So if I said to you, I have a follow up appointment next week, mm -hmm. what do you, what would that mean to you? That means that you've already had one appointment mm. and that you already scheduled another one. Yeah. So that means you have a follow-up appointment, yeah. one that's already scheduled that's after the first one. Yes, yeah, so this kind of goes back to that literal meaning yeah. of one event before another event or after another event. So we can use it as an adjective, a follow-up appointment, or you could just say, I have a follow-up mm -hmm. next week. This is as a noun. I have a follow-up. And what we understand or what is implied in this is that there's an appointment or a meeting, something you've already talked about that topic. You're already talking about going to the doctor and how did your last doctor's visit go? And you say, oh, well, I have a follow-up next week, so I'll get more information about it. And we mm -hmm. know 
it's the doctor's appointments. Yeah, I would say maybe a little bit more rarely. You can even say he has a lot of follow-up or he oh. doesn't have a lot of follow-up. Mm. People also use it, uh, use the expression follow through, mm. which kind of means the same thing. Mm. But if you say, oh yeah, he doesn't like follow-up or he doesn't have a lot of follow-up. As a noun. Mm. That means that he doesn't call people back. He doesn't mm. finish things. Mm. These kind of negative things if you say he doesn't have follow-up. Yeah, so we could use it in that literal sense to mm. say I have a follow-up, you know, I have another appointment, but if you're talking about someone's character and say he doesn't have a lot of follow-up, usually we use it in a negative way. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of follow-up. It has that same sense that nothing happens afterwards. Something should happen. <laughs> there should be some kind of conclusion to the, the task that he's working on but that doesn't happen. Instead, it's kind of cut short. Mm. So he doesn't have a lot of follow-up. Could be a way that you could use it to describe someone's character or personality. And like Dan said, we use this a little less frequently, mm -hmm. but you might hear this, so I hope it will add to your toolbox of knowledge. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our extra material section where you'll be able to dive a little deeper and see some other situations where to follow up is used. Let's watch. In this extra material section for the phrasal verb to follow up, we're going to take a look at five different clips. One's from the conversation with Brandy, three are from movies and TV shows, and the final one's from a song. Let's start with Brandy. Brandy was explaining that she met a real estate agent named Samantha, or Sam, and Sam told her about their job with real estate, and Brandy said, all right, I'm changing my life. I'm going to go to real estate school. But she didn't tell Samantha about that. And then Samantha called her and said, hey, how you doing? You expressed an interest in real estate. I wanted to follow up with you. And Brandy explained to me that she, Sam, literally followed up while I was at real estate school. So Brandy had already taken action and Sam was following up on their previous conversation. So in our clip, we use the phrase, just follow up. She followed up while I was at real estate school. We could have said she followed up with me while I was at real estate school, or she followed up on our previous conversation while I was at school. She could have used something else, but she just cut that short and said she followed up. It means she called her and wanted to get some more information, see how things were going. You inspired me. I am here now. <laughs> she literally followed up while I was at school. Like I was on lunch break when she happened to call and I was like, oh, the universe. <laughs> she literally followed up while I was at school. Like I, she literally followed up while I was at school. Like. So were those phrasal verbs new for you? Let's go on to the pronunciation lesson. We're gonna be taking an in-depth look at a couple sentences that use the vocabulary and phrasal verbs and break down the pronunciation so that you can sound more like an American speaker and speak clearly and understandably. During this pronunciation lesson, try to repeat out loud with me. Speak out loud because it's great to listen, but it's even more important when you shadow and imitate my voice. So try to do that during this pronunciation lesson. Let's go. Hi, welcome to the pronunciation lesson in the Fearless Fluency Club. Today, we're going to be focusing on five sentences that you heard in the conversation with Brandy. Each of those sentences includes a vocabulary expression or a phrasal verb that we talked about in the vocabulary or grammar lesson. So I hope that this will help you to remember that phrase because we'll be talking about it a lot. But more importantly, I hope that today you will be active and imitating what I'm saying, speaking with me, speaking out loud during this lesson so that you can feel more comfortable pronouncing the sounds of English. When you hear your own voice speaking in English, it really helps you to become comfortable with the sounds that you're making, to improve those sounds, to be more clear and understandable. So I challenge you to take action today instead of just listening to me speaking out loud. I'll be asking you, please repeat with me, say this with me, or say it after I have a little pause. <sighs> take some courage to do that, but you can do it. So let's go on to our first sentence. You're gonna be listening to a sentence from the conversation a few times, and then we will break it down in detail so that you can really understand every sound that we're saying, and also you can say it yourself. 
All right, let's listen to our first sentence. So some people try and sell on their own and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and then they connect with a realtor. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. And the phrase you heard was to be on your own or to be on one's own, to do something by yourself. And the original phrase that you heard was some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. Before we talk about this, I want to explain a little grammatical point that is happening here. She says some people try and sell on their own. Now we could also say some people try to sell on their own, but sometimes we add and here after try. I'm going to try and call my friend. I'm going to try and pass the test instead of try to pass the test try to call my friend. And this is in spoken English, a very common type of phrase. We don't really write like this, try and instead of try to, but this is very common in spoken English and it's not wrong. So if you want to include this as part of your conversation, that's perfectly fine. But I don't recommend writing in a formal way, like a formal business email or in an exam. I don't recommend writing try and plus a verb instead try to plus a verb, but you will absolutely hear this in conversation, just like in this clip, and you can use it yourself in conversation. So let's break this down pronunciation wise, starting at the beginning. She said some people, people, let's talk about this word, people. What's happening to the O in this word, P-E-O? It's just gone. We don't say people, we need to say P, say it with me, P, pull. So the final sound is P, U, L, pull, pull, people, people. Can you say those two words with me? Some people, some people, some people. Let's go to the next part. Here we have our two verbs, try and sell, try and sell. What's happening to the word and? It's just getting reduced to n, mm, try and, try and sell, try and. This happens all the time with the word and, especially when we're listing things. For example, zebras are black and white, black and white. I didn't say black and white very clearly. Instead, I reduced and to just n. Mm. This is quite common. So, do you think you can say it with me? Yes, let's say it together. Try and sell, try and sell. It kind of sounds like the word in, in. I'm going in the store, try and sell. So if you need that kind of a image in your head or those words in your head, that could help as well. Try and sell, try and sell, try and sell. On their own, on their own. This is the final part of our phrase. And let's focus on the final word, own own what's happening to the w own it's not very clear this word is not on o n so we're not forgetting the w but we're not saying own o with a woo -woo, a very clear w sound instead it needs to be own own can you say that with me let's put it together in that phrase on their own on their own, on their own. All right, do you think we can put this whole sentence together? Let's try to emphasize the right words too. Some people try and sell on their own. We're emphasizing try, sell, own. Say it with me. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. Can you think you can say this? A little bit quicker and then I'll pause and you can say it all by yourself. Ready? Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. Okay, I'm gonna pause and I want you to say this sentence out loud. No matter where you are in the world, my ears will listen to you. <laughs> I will be able to hear you wherever you are. This is teacher magic. <laughs> so I want you to say this sentence out loud. Some people try and sell on their own. Go ahead, it's your turn. Great work. All right, let's listen to the original sentence one more time, or actually a couple more times, so that you can really pick out all of the things we talked about. Listen for the pronunciation of people, 
listen for try and sell, try and sell, and then our emphasized words, try, sell, own. Listen for that carefully when you watch this clip. Let's watch. So some people try and sell on their own and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and then they connect with a realtor. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. Some people try and sell on their own. And Did you hear people try and sell? I hope so. All right, let's go to our second clip where you're gonna hear the phrase out of pocket. I want you to listen for this, this expression, but I also want you to listen for the full phrase and try to understand what's happening because we're gonna break it down. Let's watch. So for buyers, the buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. The seller pays the commission. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. In this clip, she said, the buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. There is so much pronunciation we can talk about in this short, quick sentence. So let's start at the beginning. The buyers don't. Listen to that negative contraction. The buyers don't. Don't. Do you hear don't? That T is just gone. <laughs> this happens a lot with negative contractions that we end the word with a stopped T. This means that your tongue is in the position of making a T, so it's flat at the top of your mouth. Don't. Don't. But you don't let the air pass through to make the T. Don't. That air is stopped. <laughs> so instead, you need to say don't. Don't. Do you think you can say that with me? Let's say those first couple words together. The buyers don't. The buyers don't. It helps if we link it with the next word, but the next word has a lot going on, so let's talk about that before we link it. The next word is actually. Actually. Let's break this down. There are a couple different ways that we can say actually. We could say it a little bit clearly, like I just did. Actual with an ool vowel. Actually. Or we can reduce it further, which is what's happening in the conversation. Actually. 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 So the first part is ack. Can you say that with me? Ack. Ack. The next part is just S-H-L-Y. Shly. Shly. <laughs> actually. 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 Actually, I'm pretty tired today, so I'm not going to go. Actually, it's a beautiful day. I thought it was going to rain, but actually, it's amazing. Actually. You think you can link this together with the first part? Let's do it. The buyers don't actually. The buyers don't actually. The buyers don't actually. The buyers don't actually, the buyers don't actually, the buyers don't actually what? <laughs> Let's go to the next part. Have to pay, have to pay. This is an extremely common reduction. Have and to become have to, have to. Can you say that with me? Have to, have to. I have to study English today. I have to go outside, it's a beautiful day. Have to, have to. So let's put that together. Have to pay. Can you say it with me? Have to pay. Have to pay. Let's put all of it together so far. The buyers don't actually have to pay. This is a lot to remember. You got it. The buyers don't actually have to pay. Have to pay what? Let's see. Pay anything. Pay anything. <laughs> Something a little funny is going on at the beginning of the word anything. The a anything is not so strong. It's not that we cut it out completely, but that it's really linked together in such a fast way that it almost sounds like anything, anything, pay anything, pay. You can almost think about it like in, pay in, in, like I N, pay anything, pay anything, pay instead of pay a eh, a eh, anything like a clear a sound. Instead, we're gonna say pay anything. Pay i, pay anything, pay anything. And then we have our key phrase, out of pocket, out of pocket. I want you to listen to what is happening at the end of the word out. Listen to this. Out of pocket, out of pocket. Is it out of pocket? 
No, instead, this is another extremely common American pronunciation technique where a T between two vowels is gonna change to a D sound. This is called a flap T usually because the T, the T is changing to a D. So we're going to link these two words together and say out, out of pocket, out of pocket. Can you say it with me? Out of pocket, out of pocket, out, out of pocket. All right, let's take a deep breath. I'm gonna to try to put it all together in this whole sentence. I want you to say it out loud with me, repeat with my voice. This is called shadowing. I'm speaking and you're speaking exactly with me, trying to keep up. Let's do it. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. One more time. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. You think we can speed this up a bit? Yes, you got it. Let's try to speed it up and try to say it exactly with my voice. Let's do it. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. This is also gonna help us emphasize the right words. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. Can you say that with me? The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. So we're gonna emphasize buyers pay anything and pocket. It's a lot to remember. You got it. Let's say it all together. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. I want to pause and I want you to try to say all of this together. Are you ready? Go ahead. It's your turn. You did it. Great work. All right, let's listen to this in the original conversation and I want you to listen for all of the things we talked about. To pay anything or actually or out of pocket. Listen for those linkings and reductions in the original clip. Let's watch. So for buyers, the buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. The seller pays the commission. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. The buyers don't actually have to pay anything out of pocket. Great work. Are your pronunciation muscles warmed up? I hope so. In the Fearless Fluency Club, along with vocabulary, grammar, and pronunciation lessons, you'll get access to the MP3 versions, full subtitles, and PDF transcripts so that you can study while you're cooking, driving, or even sleeping. Each module also includes a special story segment to help you remember exactly what you've learned. The story is a fun one-page combination of everything you studied during the module. Vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation, everything is combined in this story. You can listen to it, repeat it, even memorize it if you want. Heli from Mexico said, this is the best course I've ever had. That's awesome, Heli. You'll also have access to a community of motivated English learners so that you can have friends from around the world and practice speaking English together. A lot of members speak on Skype, Zoom, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger together on a weekly, sometimes daily basis. Plus, I host weekly live lessons in our Facebook group so that you can ask me questions directly and I can give you feedback immediately. Click on the link below this video and start speaking real English today. And now I have a question for you. Do you rent where you live or did you buy where you live? Let me know in the comments. I can't wait to see what you have to say. Thank you so much for learning English with me and I'll see you again next Friday for a new lesson here on my YouTube channel. Bye. The next step is to download the free PDF worksheet for this lesson. With this free PDF, you will master today's lesson and never forget what you have learned. You can be a confident English speaker. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel for a free English lesson every Friday. Bye.